South London. Um, and we're going to talk today about acute pediatric condition, respiratory conditions. Um, we're going to mostly focus on acute management uh, and diagnosis uh, with a slight touch on some of the more chronic uh, conditions. And we're going to very much be trying to focus on the practicalities of what you do and how you manage it uh, in the emergency and acute pediatric settings. So how are we going to do it? We're going to split it up. Uh, so we'll probably spend the first half to two thirds lecture talking about these conditions, um, relatively quick to pace through the major and uh, more common and serious conditions that we see presenting. Uh, then we'll use a couple of illustrative cases to consolidate our learning, um, talk a little bit about uh, what we've learned and how to, we would apply that in the most department and the differentials that we might have come up with together. And then at the end, we'll get, get some learning points together. And that's why I really want to try and uh, all the way through, be looking for your opinions and your questions and things, but especially at the end, we're going to draw up learning points together uh, and we'll bring out what you guys have felt was helpful from the session. Uh, and then we'll have, we should have plenty of time for questions at the end. So to start off, just before we get sort of kicking on all of the conditions, I'm just going to take you through a little bit of a mental model about how we're going to look at things today. So there's lots of different models people use to talk about disease. Some of you may have, have various different uh, acronyms and mnemonics that you use. Um, things like in the, uh, surgeon's gown and so on can be very popular. Um, I tend to break down things to quite a practical level, and that's what I've done here, and this is the kind of model we'll be using today. So we'll be thinking about what is the condition with, with or disease that we're talking about. So from a pathophysiological point of view, what is it exactly we're looking at? Who is it presenting? How, how does it exist? Um, then we'll talk about sort of causes and characterizations of that disease. So really, what is causing that, that illness from a, both from a, from a, is it be it infection or autoimmune or inflammatory point of view? Um, and then how is it characterized? What does it present as? What are the key features that differentiate it from the other acute pediatric respiratory conditions that we see? Uh, that's going to lead us on to questions about how do we diagnose these conditions? How do we manage them? Uh, and really all the way through, we're looking to relate all these questions back to each other. So if we know enough about what a disease is, what it's characterized by, and how it's what it's caused by, then we will be able to understand and quite easily even work out from basic first principles how we're going to diagnose and manage those conditions and where possible where we can prevent them. So I want to sort of keep those questions in mind today as we go through, be thinking about with each condition, that's how we're going to kind of structure our thinking. So these are the conditions we're going to look at today. Uh, not all of in the same are all in the sort of same priority, but particularly we're going to focus on at wheeze and in within that asthma and viral induced or episodic wheeze, um, which is one of the biggest and most common areas of acute respiratory pediatrics. Uh, we'll also spend a reasonable amount of time on bronchiolitis um, and a little more focus as well on epiglottitis with one of our much more rare but much more serious conditions. We'll have a bit of more of a whiz through some of the less uh, common or less serious conditions uh, that you can see there on the board. Um, and we're really only going to touch very lightly at the end on bacterial chest infections because it's something you'll have learned about in lots of other areas, lots of other uh, teaching. And really, there's not so much to differentiate it. Okay, any questions before we get started? There's nothing in the chat so far. Super. Okay, so let's get cracking with the, everyone's most popular respiratory condition and differential diagnosis, asthma. So what is asthma? Right, so there's deliberately very little on this slide. There's no attribute to that quote. There's, that's not a, a specific definition from any particular source. This is something that I've simplified and boiled down to the key elements I want you to focus on. Asthma is a reversible airway obstruction secondary to inflammation. Now, there are other things that you could fit within that, that, that very simple um, characterization, but these, the reason I'm putting these in and why, the reason I've boiled these things out is we're going to return to this model of what asthma is this very basic model uh, of the physiology of it throughout our talk today and talk about and that will help us understand really from first principles how we manage asthma how we diagnose it and if we keep if you keep these key elements in your mind it will all be very very simple um, and i promise that because asthma i know can be a little bit sometimes a bit intimidating sometimes it's quite a big topic and there's a lot of drugs there's a lot of different ways it can present there's a lot of um some complex elements to its management um, and it can seem like there's a lot of steps to remember, but if you focus on these areas, I promise it will make sense. So we're going to emphasize it again, reversible airway obstruction, differentiating from some of our uh, more chronic conditions like chronic bronchitis, COPD, emphysema, 
this obstruction. So that's something we're going to be looking at, sorry, how we affect that obstruction, how do we resolve it, and how, what, what does it do to our patients and how does that influence how they present. And it's secondary to an inflammation. It's usually an, what we, people call an atopic type reaction, the body overreacting to itself or to an allergen. Okay. So we've talked about what asthma is. We've talked a little bit about what's caused by in terms of, as I said, there's that heritability element to it, that atopic element that is so common. And we see it co-presenting with things like eczema and allergies and hay fever. Um, and there are very much more complex models to that pathophysiology. We'll hear people talking about the eosinophilic model or the neutrophilic model of asthma. And those are quite uh, those can be differentiated depending on age and um, sort of how acutely patients present, but as well as obviously the actual um, uh, my, micro uh, elements of disease. But what I'm looking for here is moving past that kind of overreactive model of asthma. Let's talk about the secondary causes, or what we might call triggers of asthma. Okay, so these are going to be, the, as I say, what's most practical in most pharma or in your acute season. What are some things that we know trigger off? asthma attacks. Any ideas? Well, it's going to be pollen. Sorry? Pol We've got pollen in the chat. Pollen, yeah. absolutely. It's a really good one. So a very common allergen. Yeah, um, what I said. Oh, sorry. Any Dust others? Mites. Dust mites, absolutely. Another really, really common uh, allergy and one of the most common causes of asthma and allergy in children. And certain foods. Certain foods, absolutely. Um, moving beyond allergens, any other ideas? So I think cold. Cold air, fantastic. Really underestimated and really, really common when you get dig down into histories of asthma. One of the reasons, apart from infections, that they get worse in winter is children stepping outside in, into cold air. Any others? We've got aspirin and post-infection. Yep, so absolutely. Uh, aspirin, much less common, but post infection, certainly. Um, also, obviously, acute infections can, quite apart from the actual infectious process, they can set off uh, asthma attacks of their own. Um, and we've got a few other ones so here, so I'm just going to move us along and suggest some others. So here is the uh, sort of broad spectrum. So we've, we've nailed quite a few of these allergens in general, cold air, exercise on its own, or along with any of these others, can bring these on. So it, it, it is one of the most common. What, again, one of the most common presentations when you dig into someone's history of asthma. Uh, after that, we talked about infection, which is a really good shout. Other possibilities that you then want to think about are irritants, essentially, and they can be smoking is probably one of the most common ones. So you always want to include that kind of smoking history in your questions. Um, and that's obviously, that's when you're talking to the parents as well as the child. Uh, but not to forget about the children, especially when they get into teenage years. Um, pollution is a much bigger uh, element than it used to be, and we're seeing much more asthma in inner cities uh, comparative to outside of those areas. Uh, and we recently in the UK had the first court case saying that the child actually, a large part of their death was contributed by pollution, and that's the first time that's going to be proved in the court of law outside of kind of the scientific theory. Uh, and other chemical irritants, that's getting you much more into your um, workplace asthma or things, so things like flour and so on can, can often be a cause of that, especially when you get to adults. So then we talked about what might cause asthma, but it is, what's it characterized by? What are the features of an acute asthma attack? We've got dyspnea, wheezing. Fantastic. So dyspnea covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? It's one of, and it's one of my great terms to use, struggling to breathe. Yep, so that, and that can include uh, risk seeing signs of recession, so intercostal, subcostal recessions, tracheal tug, using use of accessory muscles, breathing fast, all of that can be wrapped up into the kind of that umbrella term, which I, I love. Um, so struggling to breathe exactly. Wheeze uh, is probably the most common, most, common, most well-known sign of asthma, even if it's not always present. Um, and other things, including sort of cough and shortness of breath is the other sort of most commonly defined or just described symptom which obviously again covers an umbrella of symptoms, but it's more of a, a sensation that patients will tell you about struggling, that struggle to breathe. In terms of chronic symptoms, obviously a lot of these overlap, but any others that we would like to shout out? 
So we get things like, again, cough, we short breath and exercise. We talked a little bit just now about how that often comes out when you start taking a more of a history about our triggers. So Charles, you may, you may think, oh, this child's trigger is primarily an allergen, but actually when you dig into it, you find even with allergens aside, they're often having an attack when they're midway through their PE lesson in the middle of November. And that's that cold air exercise coming on again. The recurrent picture of episodes. So people both having chronic under symptoms, especially cough. So that child don't dismiss the child who doesn't wheeze very much, but coughs most nights and then occasionally has wheezy episodes. That's almost certainly undertreated or undiagnosed asthma. Okay. Other symptoms, more common, sort of quite chronic symptoms, if asthma is left unchecked, obviously can be things like tiredness, poor sleep, poor school performance, secondary to that kind of tiredness and poor sleep, sometimes a loss of appetite and generally just feeling unwell. Okay. Now, this is a terribly busy slide, and I hate that phrase because everyone always goes, oh, busy slide, and just turns off. I'm not expecting anyone to read this slide, including me. Okay, but I include it because this is uh, the diagnostic algorithm from the British Thoracic Society, which is kind of the gold standard in the UK and translates well across um, Europe and America in terms of how asthma is diagnosed. And really what I want you to take away from this slide is not the detail. The slides will be available in this uh, um, talk is being recorded for you to look at later on. Uh, but the key bits I want you to focus on is right up at the top, that structured clinical assessment, looking for those signs and symptoms we've just been discussing, those recurrence of episodes, recorded wheeze, history A to B, symptom variability, so symptoms coming and going, all of those up there. And along with your this clinical examination, feeding into that clinical diagnosis. And that's really why I emphasize from this picture is asthma can be a clinical diagnosis, doesn't require spirometry. Spirometry is absolutely pr preferable. And it's the reason we struggle to or often don't diagnose children with asthma over under the age of five. So children under the age of five cannot reliably do spirometry. You may have a very uh, precocious four and a half year old who you think, oh yeah, they're really good, they do what I say, but generally we don't rely on it under that age. They just can't really cooperate and produce the kind of real life, consistent effort you need um, for replicable results. Um, but you can diagnose asthma in that under five age group if you have this really high clinical suspicion that takes you down that kind of high probability of asthma side. Um, and that's what I really want you to focus on here is looking at that. If you really think someone from a clinical perspective does have asthma, you don't necessarily have to get spirometry, especially if there is a delay or the child's not age appropriate. You can start treating if there is a response, then that is asthma. Uh, we'll go on and talk a little bit about how we would treat that in a minute, but the main element is of course gonna be bronchodilator delay to reversibility. And that brings us back to my original point. If you remember that original slide, we're focused on what it is, reversible airway obstruction, secondary to inflammation. The treatment is going to be reversing the airway obstruction and dampening down the inflammation. Okay. So management, I've talked a little bit about already. So we're going to have bronchodilators. Can anyone name any? What's our favorite bronchodilator? Um, the Ventolin. Ventolin, fantastic. Yeah, and this, these aren't the trough or trick questions. Uh, ventolin or salbutamol, by far the most common and definitely the, our mainstay of asthma acute management. Um, but also we will be including in that area magnesium sulfate, epitropium and bromide, um, and also aminophilin to an extent. Apart from bronchodilation, so reversing that airway obstruction, come back to that model. The other thing we're going to want to do, I've said, is dampen down that inflammation. So we're going to think about immunomodulators. That's going to be our steroids and to an, again, to an extent, are aminophilin or theophylline, okay? So those are gonna be our main states of treatment. So again, when you remember that model of talk about what asthma is, that's gonna lead you back to acute management. You're not gonna forget your bronchodilators, your immunomodulators, and you need to address both arms of that treatment. What about antibiotics and acute asthma? Do we think we use them routinely? No. No, no. fantastic. Got some no's in the Whoever chat. said no, well done. No, of course we don't. Asthma can be triggered by infection, but primarily those infections in children, especially in the younger age group, are viral. Um, not all chest infections need antibiotics, and it's, although they may present with fever, that's going to be a clinical decision for every child. Okay, That's not to say no children with asthma will need cover. Chronic management. Again, we're going to be looking at our bronchodilators and immunomodulators, uh, but here we're going to be thinking much more about how we can prevent asthma getting worse. And so that's going to lead us much more down the line of the immune modulation. So the important thing to remember about this slide, again, this is a slide from the British Thoracic Society slash sign guidance. 
which there'll be a link to at the end. So no one try and write this down or remember it, okay? But this is here again for that illustration of what of the concept of chronic asthma management. So the thing we take away from this is the stepwise therapy. So two parts, the stepwise therapy. So remember the stepping up as required to control asthma and stepping down once asthma is well controlled or perhaps an element has been improved. So allergens have been removed or parents have stopped smoking. Um, and the other concept I want you to take away from it is if you look right at the left-hand side, everybody starts on a very low dose inhaled corticosteroid. So there is no management with beta agonists alone. Okay. If you look at that, those steps, that's all inhaled corticosteroids. I don't want to see anybody managing asthma with just ventral inhalers, which you will obviously encounter in your clinical practice. It is outdated management. It's not good care. Okay, because you're not actually preventing those acute asthma episodes, which can be so severe and so fatal. Never forget that asthma is one of the highest causes of death in children um, and is still on the rise, in particular in the UK, despite a lot of efforts to improve care and to get it at this kind of, these kind of messages out. So I want talking to you today and hammering so much about at wheeze and asthma right at the start of this talk, because it is by far the most important condition we're going to discuss and where you can make the most difference to children's uh, mortality and mobility. Any questions about this slide or what we've talked through with asthma? Okay, fantastic. So you're all going to be bang on gold standard British thoracic society guidance from now on. I'm not going to catch anybody giving just a ventral inhaler with no spacer. That's my last rant about asthma. Everybody uses a spacer. Whether you're two years old, 10 years old, or 40 years old, everybody needs to use a spacer for inhaled medication. Otherwise, you're just treating the back of the patient's throat. And I'll be very cross and fun point to hunt you down. So we've talked quite a lot about asthma. We've talked through the acute and the chronic management. I've deliberately not gone into the specific doses here. We will talk to them a little bit about them at the end, um, but they're also very easily to look up on things like the BNFC, British National Formula for Children, or British Strategic Guidance. Um, the main thing to know is they do change by weight and by age, both for the acute and chronic management, but it's important not to get too hung up on them because as I said, they're gonna change so much. It's really just key to remember the steps and the concepts behind management um, that then you're gonna be able to understand where you're going with the actual treatment. You're never wrong to look a dose up. I promise that's the longest we're gonna talk about any one condition. Let's talk about viral ep and episodic wheeze. So I hope this slide looks a little familiar now and everyone's getting the concept. Viral induced wheeze or episodic wheeze is reversible airway obstruction, secondary to inflammation. Okay, I'm not going to spend as long hammering this one home, but I hope that that looks very familiar. What's it caused by? What's some triggers of viral induced wheeze? Well, the clues in the name, you can have viral infections, but anyone else wants to suggest any other options, anything else that can cause episodic wheeze in young children? Maybe some irritants like gas or something. Fantastic, irritants. Just like we said earlier, things like uh, tobacco smoke or other irritants can absolutely cause episodic wheeze. Anything else? Allergies. Allergies, so, oh, absolutely. Again, all our same allergens, all the common ones can all cause episodic wheeze. Anything else? So I think we've got the same thing, we've got the same idea here. We're getting the familiarity. This looks exactly like our asthma slide. And it's because the same things can trigger off episodic wheeze. Okay. So which leads me on to this question, which I'm hoping some of you are already starting to think or type or even starting to type it in your little in the chat box. Why isn't this asthma? Now? You're presenting exactly the same slides. And it's not just because I'm lazy and I can create the slide twice. It's because they are to a large extent a very similar or overlapping clinical condition. But we've got some key differences, and that's what we're going to focus on now. So viral induced wheeze is just that, episodic wheeze or viral in, primarily viral induced, but can be discreet to other factors that presents, but that does not present with those kind of chronic in, interval symptoms that happen in between episodes, okay? It primarily involves the ages between one to five years. And that is partly because it will get better by five years. So most children who have just a few episodes of viral wheeze will grow out of it, um, however, it also involves that spirometry boundary we were talking about earlier. Once you can start using spirometry on children, you can start sifting out those who are true asthma and may well have been labeled as viral induced wheeze earlier on in their life from those who actually are now growing out of a few a bit of episodic wheeze 
and don't have any kind of serious spirometry issues when you start checking the lung functions. Uh, I've got the element. I'm not going to take you through a whole table of reading through things because you're all intelligent adults. Uh, but the main things to focus on there are that, as I said, are that age and that prognosis. Um, and this table that outlines that. What you will notice is that symptoms, acute symptoms on there, are not on there because the acute symptoms are very similar. The management is very similar. And we're going to move on to that now. So acute management, similar to asthma, the only element being, as you'll see from the last slide, we don't always use steroids. And that's partly because the, it, the etiology is not always that atopic picture that you see at the root of asthma. Okay, if it's just a virus, then this child doesn't necessarily need steroids. However, it's not wrong to use steroids in viral induced wheeze, particularly if you've got that child who's three years old now, this is their fourth episode of viral induced wheeze in a year, they've got quite severe symptoms. Um, and actually, really, this is probably an undiagnosed asthma or a soon to be diagnosed asthma that's just presenting with a viral infection as a trigger. Okay, so that's where that kind of clinical decision making comes in. Chronic management may be similar to asthma, but remember, that's the that slides we looked at for asthma treatment. So if you're starting to need chronic management of a viral induced wheeze patient or episodic wheeze patient, that's suggesting you don't think this is episodic and you should be thinking about an early suspected asthma diagnosis. Okay. So as promised, spend a little bit less time on that because you're such experts on wheeze now from our asthma talk that you don't need to go over that again. Any questions on wheeze in general? Yep, there's a few in the chat. So Fantastic. how similar is viral induced wheeze to laryngitis? So those are slightly different conditions. Laryngitis is inflammation of your upper airway. And this is where if I start to put uh, my modifiers or specifics into my one line reversible airway obstruction, secondary inflammation, if I haven't started to say it's your upper airway, uh, if I start to say it's not, I don't I use the word reversible or I use the word obstruction, you know, I'm starting to talk about other conditions. So laryngitis, I would class as inflammation of the upper airway. It doesn't necessarily cause inflammation, um, obstruction, and it's not necessarily reversible with the same medication. So I would definitely tease that. Think, keep that in your mind as definitely, yes, commonly presents in children, but I would keep it separate to a viral induced wheeze. It can be viral triggered, absolutely. It could also be triggered by a number of the other conditions, uh, triggers we talked about, but it will primarily cause fever, cough, can cause sore throat. It can cause some breathing difficulty, but it's not going to produce that uh, reversible wheeze picture that you normally see. Okay, and we've just got a second. Can viral induced wheeze then progress to asthma? Absolutely. But the difficulty there is that we don't know whether that person, how do we, the difficulty is our definition of asthma is someone who is now over five and having lots and lots of symptoms that we're relieving with a trial of treatment. Okay, now you can understand that that might be someone who a year ago had lots of episodes of viral induced wheeze um, that responded well to the same management. OK, so it's largely at that point a labeling decision. Uh, but yes, we can say that children who have severe or recurrent viral induced wheeze or episodic wheeze are more likely to develop asthma. But a single episode, single one or two episodes, even a one or two episodes during a child's early life do not mean that they will develop asthma. And that's the key message for parents is, yes, we're going to treat them like asthma. No, this doesn't mean your child has asthma. We will monitor them. But if they are coming in several times in one winter or seeing their GP, GP every month, then really that should be a trigger for us to be starting to take them to an asthma clinic and starting that going down that process. That's all of them for now. Thank you. Super. Very much. Everyone take a big deep breath. You've gone through the hardest and the biggest part of this talk. Okay. The other conditions. Now we've established how we think about treatment and management of these kind of conditions will be a lot easier to go through. All right. Let's talk about bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis. The clue is in the name. The is in the name for all the pediatric stroke conditions. It's not supposed to be a trick subject. Uh, it's inflammation, itis, of the bronchioles. Okay. As you remember from all your anatomy talks, the bronchioles is a terminal uh, airways, those small airways, right, which fan out all of your lungs. And actually, along with the alveoli, provide the vast majority of your gas transfer. Okay. So irritation and inflammation in these bronchioles is going to be a problem because of the uh, Poiseuille's law, your issue of the reducing radius secondary to the, the uh, reducing flow rate due to the reduced radius. So as soon as you start getting even a little bit of inflammation in the bronchial, you're losing airflow. Okay. As soon as you start losing airflow, you'll get both poor gas transfer, but also air trapping within those alveoli, as you can see on this picture here. Okay. So a picture you see with bronchiolitis can be similar to asthma. You can see cough, you can see fever, you can see even some wheeze because that airway is narrowed and that's what's producing uh, 
the we sound, but also you're going to see a picture of more of CO2 retention with that air trapping. You can see poor gas transfer. So you can see children who, even if their breathing doesn't sound too bad, are looking more and well and failing to get the oxygen, the oxygen sacs up. That's the kind of pathophysiology picture of what it is. Uh, let's talk about, so we talked a bit about there, it's infra air information, it's mucus production, the mucus production combining with the air information, blocking off those bronchioles. The other part about sort of characterization is the classical progression of symptoms. And this is the only point I'm going to hammer home for bronchiolysis. And one of the, one of the points uh, is the classical progression of symptoms. Bronchiolysis is roughly speaking a seven to 10 day acute illness. It can then last some of the symptoms. You'll hear people say, oh, it's a three weeks illness. It's a six week illness. That yes, the cough can persist for much longer, but the, the condition itself is roughly seven to 10 days. And the picture is that on the first couple of days, the child is generally pretty well with a cough and a cold, and then they appear in your a &E on day three, very, very unwell. And parents really talk about this upswing of symptoms, much worse on day three, day four, plateauing out around day four to day five, and then starting to get better. And really by day seven, you should be seeing significant improvement. By day 10, almost complete resolution of the majority of the acute concerning symptoms so we're talking about the difficulty in breathing that co2 retention that oxygenation, and the lethargy and poor feeding that goes along with it okay that kind of up and down curve and that is classical bronchiolitis and once you have that fixed in your head and you have these other the symptoms with these sort of passive physiology in your head you'll be able to nail it every single time just from the history i've diagnosed most of my bronchiolitis and virology suites without using my stethoscope at all Let's talk about what it's caused by. So I've already told you it's a viral infection, setting off this information. Anyone know what the most common one is? We've got mostly RSV. RSV, fantastic. So common and so much of it causing RSV varying from about 60 to 80 to even sometimes saying some reports are 90% that people often conflate these and say RSV is bronchiolitis, but I'm here to tell you it's not. Anyone name any other common respiratory viruses of children? I'll throw some out. You're not going to be wrong. Flu. Flu, absolutely. Flu could cause it. Any others? Adenovirus. Adenovirus, absolutely. Adenovirus gives you a nasty one. We're going to just bring up some here now in the system. So we've got rhinovirus is the common cold, by far one of the more common ones after RSV. Influenza, as we've mentioned, parainfluenza. Coronaviruses. So before COVID came along, we all met coronaviruses most commonly in pediatrics when we were doing our NPAs and they turned up occasionally. They didn't cause particularly nasty illnesses, uh, which is why COVID, of course, took so many of us by surprise. Adenovirus, as someone has cleverly mentioned, but often I find adenovirus is clinically a bit worse than some of these other ones. Uh, children often get quite high fevers and a really nasty rash. And so often you can pick that one up from a clinical point of view. We also see human metanumin virus. Uh, and a whole host of others or a combination. So it's often not unusual for children to have two or even three of these viruses present in the nose at the same time. Are they all causing disease? Hard to say, but certainly there's some evidence um, and certainly some anecdotal, strong anecdotal evidence that children who have two or three often seem to be a bit worse and more likely to deteriorate. What's it characterized by? Well, we already know what the pathophysiology is. So we're gonna be quickly able to tell me what causes this. What do we think? What are the kind of signs and symptoms children will present with? Cough? Cough, absolutely. There's tons of mucus down those airways. They're going to try and cough it all up. Will they succeed? No. Children under the age of even five to seven will routinely swallow their snot. So you won't see it. It won't be coming out of their mouth. They'll swallow it and then they'll be sick later on. Lots of snot coming up in your, on your shoes. So it's important to lean out, lean backwards when your mum tells you the child's been coughing all day, but nothing's come up. Anything else? Fever. Fever, absolutely. So it's a viral infection. You cause fever. Different viruses, you see different heights of fever. It's important not to get not to get fooled necessarily by going down the bacterial route, uh, but keep it in mind. Anything else? Dyspnea. 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 My favourite term. Again, we're talking about that kind of respiratory distress. So all those multitude of sins of respiratory distress, the signs and symptoms can come in there. Absolutely. I heard um, like very bad fatigue that the kids they get like uh, a Super important. So I can't see the names of who's saying what, but that's fantastic. That's really why I want to hear about bronchiolitis. And that's the main problem with bronchiolitis is you go off your feed, you're so tired, they don't feed well, and they're just generally exhausted. And that's one of the things we intend, to, that's why we're there to try and fix. So here we go, increased work breathing, reduced intake, that lethargy that you just mentioned, fever, cough, coriza, absolutely. Okay, how do we treat it? 
This is one of my favorite phrases and a really common mantra you now find in all ICUs, but particularly PICU. Okay, every year when we see bronchiolitis coming in, we try and stick to this idea of don't just do something, stand there. Okay, so bronchiolitis is a horrible disease to watch and everyone wants to treat it because it's nasty, but actually we've tried everything over the last couple of decades. You, if you look into the research, you'll find steroids, nasal drops, uh, bronchodilators, immunomodulators, antibiotics, all different types of ventilation, uh, all different types of nebulizers and saline, hypotonic saline, hypotonic saline. The only common thread linking all those treatments is they don't work. Okay, there is not a good curative treatment for bronchiolitis, but children do get over it. So what are we there to do in the meantime? Not quite nothing. We're going to support them through this illness. So in particular, we're talking about the lethargy and that reduced intake. That can be what really makes children very unwell and they can end up in really very severely dehydrated. So we're looking to support them with nutritional support, NG tubes being our first preferred option. Remember, these are children primarily under the age of two, most of them are under the age of one. Okay, so they will generally tolerate NG tubes and you can then supply milk down them, which is what's best for the child. Okay. Um, if they're really not tolerating that, or even if a bit of too much, even just some milk in the stomach is causing too much pressure, pushing that stomach up onto the diaphragm and making it even harder for them to breathe, which is often the case in the most really severe bronchiolitis patients, we will start on IV fluids. The other area we're going to support them in, the other arm, is the respiratory, of course. So from there, we'll be stepping up through oxygen, simple oxygen, through a face mask on nasal cannula, through onto high flow treatments like optiflil vapor therm, where you deliver just an element of pressure that's not going to fire below CPAP. So that C, then we take it straight onto CPAP as our next main treatment. Uh, and then lastly, of course, we have the option of intubation and ventilation, which is luckily quite rare. Okay, especially with good CPAP or high flow treatments, we rarely see the need to use that at all. Any questions about bronchiolitis? We're getting through our time, we're about halfway through, but those are the two biggest and most important conditions you will see in, in pediatrics. So we spent a bit more time on them. Everyone happy? Fantastic. Someone said palizumab immunization. Palizumab, absolutely. I haven't mentioned it here because it's slightly out of the realm of our acute management um, and it's not still not commonly used, particularly in the UK. It is used in our vulnerable patients. So patients, but particularly with things like chronic lung disease of prematurity um, or patients who are otherwise known to be immunosuppressed. Um, perhaps, for example, some of our cancer patients are leukemics. Um, or some people with uh, inborn areas of immune deficiency, we will use palivizumab, which is not an actual vaccine for RSV, but a uh, monoclonal antibody against it. Uh, so that's a yearly shot that you will need, treatment you will need. Um, it does work. There is some element for it. It doesn't completely protect you. And obviously the reason for that is, as we've just discussed, you can get bronchiolitis from any of the other causes. Um, but it's worth doing for those really sick, um, vulnerable patients. It's definitely not worth doing for everybody. Okay. Let's move on to creep. Everyone's favorite diagnosis to diagnose them across the waiting. So we talked about how we say bronchiolitis and asthma are clinical and we use clinical diagnoses that you rarely even need your stethoscope for. Croup, you don't even need to be in the same room. I'll diagnose croup usually from across the ED. When I hear this kind of barking sound, barking cough, We'll turn around, I'll say, has that patient had any steroids yet? And luckily my nurses in the ED are fantastic and have usually done it already, at which point we just wait. So what is croup? We're going to be a bit quicker now, so we're going to whiz through. Croup is laryngotracheal bronchitis, which is why we call it croup, because that's a real mouthful to say, um, particularly when you're trying to explain it to parents. It's caused by a viral infection, again, typically parainfluenza, but again, just like bronchiolitis, you do find other culprits, and it's the same kind of host we've just talked about. What's it characterized by? Well, so croup is inflammation of your upper airway, okay? It is reversible inflammation. It does cause an element of obstruction, but it's upper. So we're talking about seeing stridal, that barking cough that I was just mentioning. And I would really, if you haven't seen croup suggest, which this year, especially we've seen much lower levels of it, do get onto YouTube, look at a video of it and listen for that, that barking sound. Really get into your head because it will be really helpful if you are keen on pediatrics, something you're gonna see a lot of. And then that hoarse voice that you also see. It's diagnosed by, again, it's a clinical diagnosis looking at all those, uh, those talks we've done here. There is a particular uh, structure for assessing groups. So we, once we've diagnosed, once you've heard that sound, you need to check a couple of other things. And it's the things we've just been talking about. So stridor retractions is that American term so for recessions or difficulty breathing. Air entry. So this is where you do have to get the stethoscope out. 
and then your SATs and level of consciousness. This is known as the Wesley score, and it's again like a bit like looking at the BTS guidance for asthma. This is the, the gold standard for assessing group in the UK and on many other countries. A score of zero to two is mild and often won't even any treatment at all. A score of between two to five, two to sorry, two to four is your moderate group, and that will usually have treatment. Four and upwards, you're talking about more severe group where you should be thinking this child's quite well and may need more emergency treatment management and think about admission. As you can see, getting a score worth of being decreased consciousness alone or low SATs alone is enough to start scoring those high points. And that's deliberately the case because these children can suddenly deteriorate. So what is the management? Again, we've got that supportive care that we were just talking about, bronchiolitis, some helping children stay hydrated, giving them oxygen when necessary. But also here we've got, we're trying to dampen down that inflammation that we're talking about again. So it's going to be steroids. Oral is most common. So preferred, we use oral dexamethasone. Um, and we, but prednisolone is also commonly used in many European countries, such as Ireland, and sometimes in the US. We use nebulized budesonide if oral minute treatment is not tolerated. And at a push, we'll use IV treatments like hydrocortisone. Okay. Again, don't focus too much on the doses, but they are available in the notes to this lecture. In terms of other treatments for those really severe children where we're really worried about their airway closing off or they're really starting to become lethargic, dropping their sounds, we think about nebulized adrenaline. So that's where we're taking uh, the one in 1000 concentration. And so we usually use um, it's more of emergency uh, management and putting it into a nebulizer at 0.5 mils per kilo and setting it off. Again, that'll be in the notes. That is not a treatment, a cure for bronchiolitis for croup. Again, think about that. There's two parts of obstruction and inflammation. Steroids are going to cure the inflammation and actually bring that, bring that down and treat the patient. Nebulized adrenaline is just going to open it up that airway a bit, relieve that obstruction, that impending obstruction, and give you a bit of breathing space, as it were. Okay. So nebulized adrenaline will work. It usually only lasts, the effects will only last for half an hour to two hours, but it gives you time for your steroids to get in and kick in. Inhale foreign bodies. So speeding on a little bit more now, this is an x-ray of an inhaled foreign body. Can anyone spot the foreign body? I'm not gonna leave you on it too long because the answer is no, okay? And most foreign bodies aren't quite visible on x-ray. It's worth doing one in case you, know, you can see it and you can confirm placement. It's, or if you know what the foreign body is likely to be and you know it is likely to show up, um, but that's a whole other talk I could do on visibility of foreign bodies in children. Um, however, there are signs on x-ray you should be looking for. And again, those can be in the notes to this talk alongside this slide. Particularly, we're looking for, can sometimes counterintuitively, hyperexpansion on the affected side. So you're seeing more air collecting because commonly what happens is the object falls down into, the, into a bronchus and forms a valve. So you get air coming in, being trapped, and not going out. You'll then see pushing of the uh, other side, so the other side lung collapsing, heart moving over, sometimes even you start seeing the mediastinal shift, okay? And that's when children slowly start to come more and well. We can see all of those signs in this X-ray. So if you look at the right side, you'll see hyperexpanded lung compared to the left. You can see that the uh, diaphragm on the left is actually higher than the right, which is not usual. Uh, you'll see the heart is shifted over um, and you can see that there are reduced lung markings on the right side, okay? The other, the other key thing to look for is that this is all right-sided. Why is that the case? Because of the anatomy of the bronchi. <laughs> Brilliant. Whoever's just bringing that out, the anatomy of bronchus say that right main bronchus is much preferred for foreign bodies to fall into. It's slightly straighter and, uh, and it's the slightly above the left objects will fall into it first. You'll find at least sort of two thirds of foreign bodies are usually into there. Uh, and so that's what's happened here. You've got body in the right main bronchus of this child, okay? Management will be, get it out, okay? How do we get it out? You, so you're talking about bronchoscopy and usually a rigid bronchoscope, okay? In extreme measures where the child is decompensating significantly into this sort of x-ray, you might be thinking about get, putting a, even putting a chest in to try and relieve uh, pressure, but realistically, with this kind of point, it's not a pneumothorax, it's the air in the chest is filling up. So really, you need to get it out. Characterized by sudden onset cough. And in your questions for exams, which this is a very common exam question because it's really easy to write, it'll be an unattended child who suddenly starts coughing and then develops respiratory distress, okay? Now that's not necessarily always the case. As a parent, I can tell you, you can watch child all you like, they'll still put stuff in their mouth. 
but it's definitely in your exams, it will always be the child. Mum just turned her back for a minute and now the child's coughing and can't breathe. Okay. Um, they do present quite acutely in exams, but in real life, uh, because you can manage quite well on one main on one lung, or particularly even if you've dropped out, if it's dropped down further and it's only blocking off one lobe, they can sit there for longer and then you can start to see signs of infection and bronchiectasis, natalectasis. Uh, diagnosed by again that clinical management because we talked about how you won't necessarily spot it on x-rays so it's that clinical suspicion especially in your under fives managed by we've talked about rented by there's really not you can much you can do as a parent but you do your best let's talk about epiglottitis because it's one of our favorite conditions everyone know what epiglottitis is and why this slide is so important can anyone give me an idea of what epiglottitis is Infection. Um, and closes up the airways. Brilliant. There's two people there, roughly the same idea. Inflammation of the epiglottis, and yes, it can close off your airway in a big way. So, important thing is to stay calm. Let's look a bit more at the anatomy. So, you can see the epiglottis here is at the narrowest point of the airway, particularly in children. So, even a little bit of swelling can block that off. Uh, let's look. So, that's what another picture of sort of what you should be looking down when you're trying to scope. So, this is what you hope to see. This is a beautiful little picture. So I love to see when I'm doing an intubation um, and you can see the epiglottis at the top there. If it swells up, what you get is this. Um, and so there you can see at the bottom of a tube that is going through the vocal cords there. It's a fantastic intubation by whoever did it because the airway is almost completely blocked off by that massive red epiglottis. Okay. And the key here is that you have got the airway in. Uh, very soon after before they got this tube in, they would have lost the ability to get a tube at all. Okay. So What's it characterized by? So you get tripoding. That's this kind of characteristic picture where children be sitting forwards, leaning on their hands, really trying to maximize their airway volume and not move much at all because they can sense that their airway is going to go. Uh, they're drooling because they just aren't interested in swallowing. Again, they've got that sensitivity in their throat. They just are very, very aware, even on a subconscious level, of how vulnerable their airway is. And with all that put together, especially with a the fever, they look what's called toxic. These are all key words. The reason I put those in quote air quotes is this is going if there, any of those words come up in your exam it's going to be epiglottitis <laughs> okay, or at least you have a high suspicion for it so i'm talk, giving this talk mostly for you or practical levels but also for your thinking towards those, your exams these are very common stems okay um, strider is often a feature but often you won't even have to get close enough to hear the strider Charles and respiratory distress you're asked to go look at them they look like this that's epiglottitis until you've proven otherwise okay uh the other main differentials would be things like a yes and inhaled front body or a really severe croup. But if that's this is the severe croups is where this really shades into epiglottitis and where you really, if you're not sure, you treat it as epiglottitis. Management, anyone want to venture a guess? How do we treat this? How do you, as a first year junior doctor working in AE, treat this? Maybe steroids? Good thought, because you want to dampen down the inflammation, but no. You consult a senior doctor. Fantastic. Thank you, Kavine. I think that was saying that. I probably got the name wrong. But um, yes, the management of epiglottitis is I need help. Okay. The answer is you don't manage it. You get some help. Okay. And that's not to be patronizing. That's not aimed at junior doctors. It would be my reaction. I have seen epiglottitis, despite how rare it is. And we still went as a pediatric registrar. I'm still going to go get help. Okay. Who am I going to get help from? The airway specialists. OK, the people who can save this child's life, we're going to get an ENT specialist and or an anesthetist, whoever can provide front of neck access in your hospital there before you do anything else. OK, the reason for this is epiglottitis doesn't always progress to closing off the airway, but it can with even a little bit of stress or upset. OK, so you don't go near the child. You don't try and get them to swallow some stories. You definitely don't get your IV cannula out. If, if you give, put some oxygen near them, if they'll tolerate near the face, fantastic. If they won't tolerate it. I'll tolerate lower, their lower sats for them, okay, rather than try and push that mask onto their face. This is where you're getting your senior, you call your consultant, absolutely, but actually my first call would be to those airway specialists before I even called my consultant. You then are going to get your, you're also going to get your play specialist down, whoever's best with children in your department, especially parents, and really try and keep this child calm. What will happen when you do have those specialists present for your everyone's interest is they'll are usually ideally gradually, often with gas induction, or really calmly uh, get, put the child to sleep, establish an airway as fast as and safely as humanly possible. And then we can start putting out IV cannulas in, starting our supportive care, which is going to be antibiotics and yes, if necessary, steroids. Okay. 
uh, and along with things like hydration, these children will often be quite unwell, feverish, dehydrated. What are we treating the antibiotic? What are the antibiotics treating? Anyone know? Causative organism in hepatitis? Hemophilus influenza. Super. Why is, why is hepatitis super, super rare now? Uh, because of vaccination compulsory. Because we vaccinate. We routinely vaccinate children against hemophilus influenza. However, just like all the other conditions on this list, you could potentially get an infection or inflammation of hepatitis of your epiglottis that separates to something that wasn't hemophilus. Uh, and also, obviously, unvaccinated children exist. Um, so we do, you do still see it, you do still need to know it, and it will definitely come from your exams. But as well as those keywords I've mentioned for your exams, exams, the other thing will be an unvaccinated child or a child recently arrived from abroad, okay? Because that's going to always lead you down the thought of, ah, this could be hemophilus. Whipping through our last couple of things, so pertussis or whooping cough. Now, this is where I really hope this video is going to work. Tell me if the sound's going through on here. All right, we're not going to watch this full video. What I wanted everyone to catch there is the intake of breath in between coughs. Everyone get that? Yes. So you obviously you'll have this video to watch again later at your leisure when the uh, record's going around, the slides there, the link will be at the end. Uh, but it's that cough, 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 <gasps> whoop, okay? And that whoop is what gives the disease its name and what's so characteristic of pertussis, okay? So again, that's going to be classic for your exams, um, but also for real life. Uh, so what's whooping cough caused by? I've mentioned it a couple of times, so everyone should know. The Bordetella pertussis. Bordetella pertussis, fantastic. It clears in the name, well done. Um, what's it characterized by? We've just looked at it. So intractable coughing, unwell chill, child, sudden whooping cough. Now the difficulty there is that Bordetella pertussis, if you look it up in slightly more detail, actually has a quite a long progression of symptoms and these can come on at different times. So you can have intractable coughing prior to the child having a fever, prior to becoming more lethargic and unwell. So you may see them at different stages of this illness, but the cough and whoop will have been there at some point in the illness. That's important. That's why your history is so important. Diagnosed by, again, it's the clinical diagnosis. Again, your exams, you're going to be looking at those unvaccinated children, or children recently arrived from abroad. Managed by antibiotics. Okay. Prevented by? Vaccination. Vaccination. Fantastic. Someone's already catching on to my love for vaccination. It's not just because of COVID. Lastly, and least importantly, ironically, is bacterial chest infections. Now, this is not to say they don't happen in children and they can't be lethal because they do and they can, but you've all learned about bacterial chest infections in multitudes of other lectures and, and formats. And so I'm not going to bang on about them here. If What I'm essentially including this at the end for is to give you the license to say, if a child presents from respiratory difficulty and they have a cough and a fever, and you've excluded all of the other things that we've just talked about, you then have my permission to go ahead and think about whether they have a bacterial chest infection, okay? So almost the reverse to adults where you'll be thinking, oh, this person's got a cough and a fever, let's get them started on this Kermox tab right away so we can get them out of my emergency department. In children, I want you to do the complete opposite and exclude all these serious, the really much more serious viral causes that will kill the child before you go ahead and give them some Kermox tab and send them home, okay? This is just a extra, couple of extras to demonstrate the importance of getting that AP and lateral views. You can see that it's a bit hazy there, particularly on the left. Is that viral? Is it bacterial? There's absolutely no way of knowing. You switch to the lateral view and you can see much more solid consolidation, heterogeneous uh, and homogeneous inflammation. Uh, and so that's why I really always do bang on about getting those lateral views. Okay. Again, management is going to be antibiotics as per local protocol. Uh, I really want you to not focus too much on bacterial chest infections because I really want you to think about the other things we've talked about today. As there. Okay, let's talk about some cases. Just before we do, everyone take 30 seconds. Think of a question if you have a question. If you don't, take a drink. We've talked quite a bit and there's a lot of information just gone through. Okay, and then we'll move on to think about a couple of cases. I know that's a loss in one go. Any questions about all those conditions? You can feel free to um, put them privately in the chat if you don't want to speak up, that's fine too. That's also absolutely fine, yeah. I'll have a look at the chat now that I've got a bit more space. And just going back through, I can't see anything that we haven't really addressed, but as I say, uh, I'll be having this a lot more. I'll look at this again at the end, towards the end, and we'll have another uh, time to look at questions. 
Right. Um, sorry, I've got one question. Do you have yeah. a vaccination tattoo? Is it, is it mandatory for all pediatricians? <laughs> it's a club. We're very keen on this. Uh, yeah, we are very keen on vaccinations, pediatricians. Uh, it's massively reduced our, our not our, work, well, our serious workload and our mortality, which we're quite keen on. Um, like with all doctors, we're desperately trying to put ourselves out of job and vaccinations do a lot of that for us. Um, yes, it's it's almost a requirement to be pro, I'd say quite heavily pro vaccination. Right, let's get this in. Let's talk about our first case. So these, this is case one is James. He's a four year old boy. You're asked, he's coming to A&E in the triage nest community to South. Definitely like he's bumping him up this. Go and have a look at him. A little cough and mum says he's got some noisy breathing. Can you go and have a look at him, please? She hands you some observations before you go over. And as you're making your way across the room, you have a look. His temperature is 37.7, so he's a little bit warm. His respiratory rate 38. Now, I don't expect you to know normal ranges for children, but I will tell you that's a little bit fast for James. Uh, his saturations are on the low side, but they're still within our normal range. We're definitely not worried, worried. You get over to James' side, and like all good pediatricians, you keep your stethoscope in your pocket or around your neck before you get anywhere close to, to him, okay? We don't upset children. We don't start putting cold metal stethoscopes on them or horrible things or touching them even before we've had a really good look. So you have a good look. He's got some tracheal tug evident from the end of the bed. <laughs> he's really struggling away. He's making this kind of <gasps> noise, okay? And he's got some recessions that you can see when you ask mum to gently lift his pyjama top up. So you've characterised that as tracheal tug, muscle cross recessions and some stridor rest. What are we thinking about? Croup. Croup, absolutely. Anything else? What else are our differentials? Foreign body aspiration. Foreign body aspiration, absolutely. It's entirely possible for him to have a bit of a temperature because it's hot in the room or because he's got a concurrent cold and he stuffed something up his nose or in his mouth. Anything else? Do we think this boy has hepatitis? No, we don't think he has epiglottitis. I haven't given you any of the clues he's got epiglottitis and it's in the correct exam this person is not going to be epiglottitis. However, I still want you to have in the back of your mind this vague suspicion as why you're not jumping to, to attack him with any kind of needle at this point, okay? So let's say we talk to mum, we don't think he's got an inhale bone body, he's coughing a bit more, we can hear that kind of stridor and that cough is now really distinctive. It's kind of barking dog-like or seal-like sound. What are we now leaning towards? Out of those three we're just talking about? A croup by parainfluenza. Croup by parainfluenza, fantastic. Well done, Kavine. That's exactly what we're thinking about. How are we going to manage, how are we going to assess this group? What are we going to use to decide how sick he is? Any kind of scoring system anyone's heard of? We're going to look at our Westy score, okay? So we're going to plug our assessment of James into this score and decide how sick he is. And that's going to help us guide our management. So looking at James, what do we think? He's got some stridor at rest. So that's giving us a two. He's got some mild recession. So that's giving us another one. His air entry, you have a listen. And it's okay bilaterally. It's kind of it's a bit grumbly. His saturations are okay. And his level of consciousness, he's sitting up. He's talking to you. He says he's all right. Okay. So based on, depending on how really, how bad his recessions look, he's either scoring a three or a four in a Westie score. Okay. So how are we going to manage that? We're plugging him in as we're saying this is a moderate croup. What do we think we should do? Give him some nebulizer. Fantastic. What are we going to nebulize? Adrenaline. Adrenaline. It's, okay. it's definitely a possibility. Uh, yeah, it will help that airway obstruction. For me, at the moment, he's only scoring three or four. And he's still sitting up and talking to me. He doesn't seem particularly agitated and his saturations aren't dropping. I think we've got a little bit more time with James before we need to jump in with adrenaline. I would start off with some steroids, okay? So I'd start off probably with, with the dose in the UK would be an Ordex methadone at 0.15 milligram per kilo, uh, which you can step up gradually to up to a maximum of 0.6 milligrams to, per kilo of total. Um, yes, if he deteriorates while you're in the department, certainly you're going to observe him for a while. And if he gets worse, you're going to think about adrenaline. So it's not, you're not wrong. But to always remember that the difference between those two arcs of reducing the obstruction is what adrenaline's for. At the moment, his obstruction isn't terrible. We've got some time. And reducing the inflammation, which is what our steroids are for, which is what's going to bring this down and really get it under control. Okay. Marek is a two year old boy. Now, I made this a bit more tricky. He's got two or three cough days of cough and chorizo, and he's suddenly much worse this morning, mum says. 
He's, he was laughing snotty the last couple of days, and then today he's got much, much worse. He brings him to about lunchtime because he's really starting to struggle with his breathing. What are we thinking just from that headline? Bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis, absolutely a reasonable possibility. Anything else? Maybe. Fine juice weeds, absolutely. Those are going to be our two main diagnoses, aren't we? We can once you've, we've thought about those properly and had a really good in thought, uh, we'll, we'll let you guys. We'll also allow the possibility of things like chest bacterial chest infections, pertussis, things like that. But really, absolutely, our main two possibilities are that he's got a wheeze or he's got bronchiolitis. So, notoriously difficult to tease out. Let's have a look. His respiratory distress, he has got some tachypnea, he has got some of that dyspnea we were talking about, with a respiratory rate of 50, uh, intercostal and subcostal recessions, and his saturations are 92%, despite the nurse and triage having popped him on some oxygen, so he's getting five litres ably held on by mum, but he's still not saturating very well. Now, regardless of whether we think this is bronchiolitis or viral induced wheeze, do we think this child is well or unwell? Unwell. Unwell, fantastic. This is the most important key skill I want you to level up with. Okay, is sick or not sick? Who would we be calling help for? Who would we be getting some help with? Who? A senior doctor. Senior doctor. You can get the senior pediatrician to come over and have a look at this child because they are quite sick. Okay, but in the meantime, we're going to start some management. We have a listen. We're finally allowed to get our stethoscope out. You've done all the looking. Okay, and I'm going to allow you to listen to his chest. And you can hear wheeze all over his chest. What are we now thinking? Viral induced wheeze. Fantastic. You guys are all already respiratory pediatricians. He's got viral induced wheeze. Okay. So two year olds are particularly difficult. We do have that overlap. Under ones, even if there's a bit of wheeze, we're thinking it's almost always going to be bronchiolitis. Over two, if there's wheeze or cough or even just dyspnea or respiratory distress in the absence of wheeze, it's almost certainly going to be virus induced wheeze or asthma. That's by far the most common cause. Uh, okay. In between that 18 months to two years window, that can be really difficult. Bronchiolitis can absolutely cause wheeze, as we mentioned. Wheeze can present, can present with sudden upswings and symptoms like bronchiolitis does. So it's kind of really tricky. But here, if he's got audible, with, basically this is a clinical decision. And a two-year-old with audible wheeze everywhere and respiratory distress, I would have no hesitation going down the wheeze side of things and treating. And that's the real key difference and why you have to learn this is with a bronchiolitis patient, we'd be going, well, mum, there's not much we can do. With a wheeze patient, we are going to do a lot and aggressively. Okay, because this, as we said, this is a sick child. So what are we going to do? We talk a bit more to mum as we're doing it. She said, oh, yeah, he does get asthma, he does have hay fever, and I've got asthma. So we're now very happy with our diagnosis. Okay, we've shifted away from bronchiolysis. We're confident what we do. So what are we going to do? Remembering that reversible airway obstruction and that inflammation. What are we going to do? Nebulized steroids. Nebulized steroids, very much, okay, a possibility. We tend to use oral steroids as a first line in, in the UK. We talk about oral prednisolone being our first choice. If not tolerated, we think about IV hydrocortisone. If absolutely not managing it, yes, I, I never like to be is a possibility. Uh, but let's think about our airway obstruction first. What are we going to do for that? Like salbutamol or um, the Ventolin or something? Exactly. So salbutamol or Ventolin, as you say, the same medic they're both the same medication, Ventolin, just the, the brand name. And that is going to be our first line. So we're going to nebulize in salbutamol. I would usually go with something like what we call burst therapy in the UK, which is a nebulizer of salbutamol, followed by another nebulizer of salbutamol with some methotropium bromide, and then another nebulizer of salbutamol with some methotropium bromide. We'll do those back to back, and then we'll look at what the effect has been. Okay. The usual effect is we drive the patient's heart rate up a lot, but we make them feel a lot better. Okay. This gives you some time, like all, all of our treatments today, we're talking about the managing the symptoms and the signs that are going to make the patient really unwell to give us the time to manage the cause of disease. So again, that's going to allow us to get the steroids in. You try and give prednisolone to a child who literally can't breathe, they'll just vomit them back at you. Okay. So this is a slightly more structured version of what we just said. We do our ABCD assessment, which I hope everyone has got kind of logged into their brains now as we're coming into your, the final years of med school. Um, so set, I would assess the chart. This is just, the key thing what you say for your clinical exams is I can see that this is a sick child with a respiratory distress. I would do an ABCD assessment and call for senior help, which already you've outlined to me. I would then start some oxygen because this child's saturation is low. So we're going to whack it up. I would give some nebulized subvitamol. I would combine that with some epitropium. In a two-year-old, these are our usual doses we'd use. When you get above five years, we, tend to go to, we then tend to go to five milligrams and 250 of epitropium. I'd give all prednisolone, the dose he has to say is there is around one milligram per kilo. We tend to go with a, a standard of 20 uh, milligrams in small children. 
going up to 30 or 40 and that are larger or older children. And then I would reassess. And this brings me on to my last point about management of acute respiratory pediatrics is the importance of reassessing. Okay, in all of the conditions, particularly uh, bronchiolitis and induced wheeze, we know that there's that progression of symptoms. We know that there's a reversibility that we're looking to induce in wheeze or croup uh, or epiglottitis. We're looking to reverse those, those symptoms. So we need to go back and check that we have. Okay, and that's going to be really key to determining how far you go. With this child, with someone presenting, as I say, I would call a sick child, someone with severe wheeze, I'd be thinking about early IV access. If this all this doesn't work, I'm going to want my IV magnesium sulfate, aminophilin, or even adrenaline. Okay. So what are our learning points from today? Anyone want to shout out anything they think they've particularly found that they're going to take away from today and apply in practice or that's particularly useful things they've learned? It's okay if you haven't learned anything, but, you know, hopefully there's something. Making sure you call the ENT or anesthetists before the peds reg and epiglottitis. Absolutely. I wouldn't have thought of you that. You can always call me. You can always call the peds reg. It's absolutely fine. But I'm going to say, great, get off the phone, call the ENT surgeon. I'm on my way. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Any other takeaway points? Uh, always exclude viral causes for respiratory conditions. Absolutely. Viral infections is much more common in children than in adults, much more common than, in, than bacterial infections. And unlike in adults, pre-COVID at least, viral infections make children much sicker uh, and, and typically are much more dangerous. Not much related to damn bacterial infections, just overall, they cause much more mortality and morbidity. That there's nothing you can do for bronchiolitis. Yes, I love you. Bronchiolitis, obviously there, are tr there is supportive care, but there is not a curative management. And so if you, when you see um, the sort of out-of-date consultants giving nasal steroid drops or Prototyping hypertonic saline nebs. I'm not expecting you to challenge them, but I want you to quietly roll your eyes and promise me that you won't be doing it. Okay? Because it doesn't work. Anything else? Actually, you've hit on the two main ones I want to pull out today. So, management bronchitis is supportive, epiglottitis is an emergency. Okay? So, the phrase for clinic exams is a medical, this is a medical emergency, and I would call for senior help from airway specialists. Okay, in my hospital, the, the lines are supposed to trot out because these are what's going to have your examiners going super. This person is safe to work in my hospital. Okay, so I can trust this person in the middle of the night to save this child by not attacking them with a needle, as opposed to adults where I assume they throw needles around. I know this business. Um, some other learning points to take away. Uh, one of the th key things I think you ordered really well when we we're just going through the cases is. The first case was much more clearly upper airway. And although we've not been dividing these cases, these conditions into upper and lower airway, because I think sometimes that can be a little bit confusing for people, um, particularly where there's overlap, you very quick, clearly gave me the differential for an upper airway issue. And then when we went to the second case, your differential was very clearly the lower airway conditions. Okay. So if that's helpful to you to split up the conditions that way, then if you go back to this lecture, you'll notice that that is roughly how it's structured and that, that is what those cases are focusing on. Okay. Right. So, time for last questions. Or anything else anyone wants to quiz on? We stuck roughly to time, just about. I think we're going for about an hour. So we've got some very time well now. to time. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask them in the chat or unmute. And I'm just going to put a feedback form in the chat as well. If everybody could fill it in while we're doing questions, it's really helpful both for us and for Dr. Durant to improve all of our talks in the future. Thanks. And any questions can go in the chat or feel free to unmute and just ask. I'll give you time about a minute or so to ask any more questions. If there aren't, um, I'm very happy if people are wiped out. If there's a couple of common myths and misconceptions, I'm happy to clarify on the last couple of slides I've got, um, but it all depends on people's appetite and energy levels. I have more of like um, maybe, um personal questions sure. like, uh like i'm a third year medical student so like i have a pretty long way to go still uh how did you like choose to become like a pediatrician like because right now i'm at that time when i have to like choose which specialty mm -hmm. yeah uh very good question so the first thing i would say is although it feels like you have to choose you, you, I, I know that systems are different in um in Czech Republic and so on but you absolutely don't have to have to choose, okay? There is a lot more time than you think. Um, but certainly by third year, I was starting to consider pediatrics. Um, I, I did 
Uh, for me, it was when I first encountered doing pediatrics clinically uh, that solidified my decision. Uh, so I already liked children, worked with children, found old people very uh, sad and annoying. Um, and by old people, I mean everyone above the age of like 12, 25, um, which now includes me. Uh, so that was already a, a helpful part for me, but doing pediatrics, getting that experience, and it really helped solidify it. Um, I then went on to do extra pediatric modules where there was possible during medical school. So where I was given options of what specialists to do, I chose to do extra pediatrics. I did spend my elective year, or my elective, sorry, months uh, in Great Ormond Street uh, intensive care unit, uh, which really helped solidify my interest in airway management um, and in kind of the really sick children and showed me that it huge breadth of stuff that you can do in pediatrics which is one of the things that attract me to it um so that's how i got interested in it from a personal point of view in terms of how practically do you get yourself ready if you're talking about how you apply to pediatrics uh that's the same sort of stuff just get involved get some experience so you've got something you can talk about when you're going to use interesting cases you've seen um the epictitis that i've seen for example which is something most pediatricians haven't seen i saw because i was doing an extra night on my pediatric rotation in an any &E, in an area that uh, took a lot of people coming from Heathrow. Um, but yeah, it, get yourself involved, look up uh, practice. It doesn't have to cost you lots of money and it doesn't have to be something that takes a huge amount of time. Just start getting interested, uh, going to talks, uh, seeking out the extra experience. Um, and so realize adults are sad. Adults is really sad. It's just old people. Old people and obstetrics, I think. Um, there's a question here in the chat. Any general advice to create a healthy environment for children's growth? Vaccinate, 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 warm hugs, obviously. Uh, absolutely, those are really, really important. But uh, also, health promotion is a really key part of pediatric work now. So absolutely, it's a really good question. Um, so health promotion encompasses a lot of things, but we should be thinking about uh, improving our knowledge on children's mental health, which makes a huge difference to their physical well-being. Uh, children's nutrition. So if you do have ever, ever had an opportunity or time to spend with a dietitian in your hospital, uh, or if you get any talks from a dietitian, I really highly recommend it. Pediatric dietitians in particular are really willing to share the knowledge and they're really, really good. And there's a lot of knowledge there to gain, especially in the early years of child's life. That can make a much bigger difference than any kind of management we're putting in. Um, uh, and then we're talking about pollution, irritants, smoking. Um, and lastly, obviously, there's all the safeguarding elements to think about. Healthy environment for children's growth has to include um, that warm hugs needs to be on your mind as a byword for a catch-all for a loving environment that promotes children's well-being um, and that's one of the biggest things that will make a difference to children's physical health as well not just their emotional or mental health i think that's really important and something a lot of us don't consider so thank you very much no no um, i think no worries. Uh, no, I'm glad it's helpful. Um, the big message I would take away from that, that's all very easy to say, but is try and get some, um, if you can, look for that experience with non-medical specialists. If you're interested in pediatrics, a lot of our work is that kind of MPT stuff. So I really enjoy my time. I spend a lot of my closest sort of colleagues and stuff people I work, have most fun with or spend most time with are safeguarding nurses, for example, or dietitians or physiotherapists, uh, because they are addressing those areas, which is just not something I get training in. All right. Um, I'm going to skip on to a couple of things that people are interested, but um, so here's the references for the reading. These are some sites I would really suggest if you are interested in pediatrics, it's a good places to go. So Radiopedia is where all my uh, extra images are from. It's a fantastic starting point if you're interested in that sort of thing. Don't forget Bubbles is a fantastic UK-based uh, pediatric free online access medical uh, learning website. It's really, really helpful, along with uh, Archem Learning, which is the Royal College of Medical Medicine, um, and BTS Sign Guidance, as I say. If you're going to learn, if there's one piece of guidance, if you're the sort of person who thinks oh, I like to look up guidelines, then before your exams or before working in the UK for, in particular, BTS sign guidance and those bits that I've referenced earlier are key that you are going to use all the time. People expect you to know. Nice CKS is just a top tip. If you're ever trying to look up a condition, something like croup or hepatitis, and just trying to find reliable information about them. If you just type nice CKS and then type the condition in, you usually get a decent summary at a level that is aimed at um, primary care specialists in particular, which usually works well for, uh, I find not, now that's not a crack at primary care specialists in that saying, oh, they're the level of med student. It's that um, that's, it's a slightly lower level, level below the kind of what you'd expect from a secondary care pediatric specialist, which fits nicely if you're in the kind of learning to be that person. Um, these are some of the more specific references that I've used in places you can get some of these images and references. So there will be links there if you want to access it in your own time. Um, 
And then I've, I've got about five minutes if people want to do any kind of bonus around a couple of common misconceptions. But if energy levels are gone and everyone wants to go home, that's absolutely fine. I think we are definitely game for bonus rounds. We've okay. got lots of let's bonus get round. I've got two two very quick points. I'm gonna these are like sort of common as a pediatric respiratory person. This is some of my most common questions I get um, from students I work with and so on. So hang on, let me just close my. Yeah. So I talked a lot earlier about restrictive airway disease or, or obstructions. So we talked about um, obstructive disease and wanting to fix that. Um, and how we're going to resolve airway obstruction. That fits nicely into what is obstructive and restrictive airway disease. Anyone has any guess? Anyone anyone seen this slide before? I hope it's been taught in your in your medical school time, but obviously your different years may not come up. So we're going to do it in about a minute. Okay, obstructive versus restrictive airway disease is all about whether the air can get in or out and what's happening when it does. So. At the top, you've got your red line. Now, this is just for picture. I don't want you to try and learn all the spirometry by looking at this or even remember the different ratios. That's not important, okay? Because there are other people um, like myself and much and people way above my level who will interpret spirometry for you. You will have to do it for your exams, so it's worth checking in at some point. But the, this concept is what's important here. Normal lungs, you, as you can see from that curve, you can breathe out most of your airway capacity very, very quickly. That's your FOV1, one second. The rest of your airway capacity is hardly any. So you can breathe it all out very quickly and then the rest is a bit of a trickle. You can test this out for yourself by taking a massive deep breath in right now. <sighs> Try and breathe out a bit more, there's not much left. That's your FBC, your forced life capacity, the rest of the airway you can get out, okay? That's breathing out, but it, the, the, the conditions will apply to breathing in as well. So as you can see from the restrictive uh, F color, so that's roughly sort of yellow, amber kind of color, the shape of the graph is the same. You still breathe out most of your airway fast, most of your air fast in the FV1, and then the rest a bit slower, okay? But the problem is that there's that graph, that line is a lot lower, isn't it? There's a lot less volume in total. And that's the issue with restrictive airway diseases. You are reducing the lung volume and the total ability to breathe air in and out, okay? So it's just that the airway is becoming much less compliant, the lungs becoming less compliant, there's less lung volume for gas transfer. All of those elements uh, will, from diseases like cystic fibrosis in particular in pediatrics, um, fibrosing alveolitis in adult conditions, um, things like emphysema, all of those will lead on, or destructive emphysema in particular, or bronchiolitis of litterans, all of those conditions, um, which you can look up another time, restrictive conditions where the airways are becoming fibrotic, stiff, they're not compliant, so you just can't move the air very well but when you do, it's the same normal pattern. There's just less of it. Does that make sense? That's restrictive air way diseases, okay? The air's not moving very well. So there's, your lungs are just not as good overall. Obstructive diseases are different and that's why it's hammered home in medical school. And that they're actually much more common and much more useful to remember. That look at that graph, it's a completely different shape. You're breathing out much less of your total lung capacity, your FBC. I know that doesn't sound total lung capacity, stay with me, in that first second. And you are then continuing to breathe out over the time, almost getting up to the same level of the restrictive disease. As I say, the different quantities are not the important bit. The exact spirometry is not the important bit. The important bit is the shape. So some of the structural airway disease can keep breathing out and out and out uh, over a much longer period of time. But that takes a long time. So what you get in respect to disease is an inability to get all the air out because you get tired and you have to breathe back in again. Okay, so what it leads to is air trapping. So with obstructive diseases like COPD and asthma and viral induced wheeze, you get due to the extreme length of time it would take you to properly get it, your lung volume emptied. You don't pick, people can't do that. And so air gets trapped over time. That air that's trapped over time is obviously higher in CO2 and lower in oxygen. And that gets worse and worse over time as gas transfer continues. Okay, so the picture is of someone who struggles to breathe in because there's already lots of air inside okay when you the reason that this is already helpful is if you start providing a little bit of pressure to hold the air open you they can breathe out better so almost counterintuitively you're helping to breathe out in order to help them to breathe in okay so remember that pushing air in for something like 
um, and obstructive seats isn't necessarily going to fix the problem. It would just be more air trapped. But helping to keep the airways open, giving that bit of pressure to prop them open, will allow them to breathe out for longer and therefore exchange that gas. This, bit of, this is how I look at restricting real structure diseases. It took me a while. They're hammered a lot in med school, but they're not explained very well. It's, I hope that's helpful. It's a model I use, and it's the kind of the simplified the down version. But it really, I want you to, if you are worried about it, try and come back to this. Make your own model if necessary, but think about that different shape of the graph, and that will tell you a lot about how the lung, what the lungs are actually doing, what's going on inside them, and how you're going to treat those conditions. Okay. Any questions about that? No, that's one rant. Last one I tend to have is people ask me about bronchiolitis and bronchitis. Now, even the most useful website on the internet, Wikipedia, mixes these up. Okay, so don't feel bad if your lecturers get it wrong or if you've not understood or if you don't know what the difference is between bronchiolitis and bronchitis. You're not alone. People make the same, have the same problem all the time. However, I'm here to tell you that the answer is simpler than you think. Bronchiolitis is inflammation of the bronchioles. Can anyone guess what bronchitis is? The inflammation of bronchi. Yes, I love you, whoever you are. Don't be fooled by the multiple websites and even scientific papers that claim these are the same condition that they're not. Okay, the airways are different. So the size of the airways are different both the size, but not only that, but the cellular makeup of the airways. If you look into, if you, someone who's particularly interested in respiratory anatomy, you'll find the lining of the airways is different if the bronchioles, they're much more, uh, but not, not just so the lining is different, they're going to be more prone to inflammation. Uh, they're going to produce much more mucus. There's going to be more air trapping secondary to that, but also because of Poiseuille's law, which uh, some of you may remember and will be banged on about in the first couple of years of med school, but because of that kind of inverse square law where your flow rate decreases uh, at an exponential rate given when you reduce the radius, in a, in a smaller airway, you have a much bigger impact on airflow with even a little bit of information. So you do produce different pictures. The other main difference here is that bronchitis is typically a picture of a, a disease of older people uh, and is often caused by more irritants. You do get it with smoking. You do get it in infections. You do get it in bacterial infections. You do get it viral infections. You do even get it in children but it's not bronchiolitis and it doesn't produce all those characteristic progression of symptoms that we talked about during this talk, okay? Don't get that characteristic upswing and change in symptoms. It can be much more chronic. You don't get the some deterioration of day three. You're not getting this necessarily the same air trapping because the airways are still much more patent, okay? So you're not necessarily getting as much of an obstructive picture, um, although you can, uh, and you're not getting so much mucus production, which is so characteristic of bronchiolitis. One of the key last bits of bronchiolitis that will help you remember it is all that mucus production shifts around in children's chest continuously um, and produces, therefore, a massive range of science. And I know a, a very good pediatric emergency consultant who used to say that if you send three medical students to examine the same child and they all come back with different reports, then it's bronchiolitis until you've proven it otherwise. And that's not because he thought medical students were rubbish. OK, <laughs> it's because bronchiolitis will sound different every time you listen to the chest because the chest is so dynamic in, in young children and the mucus is being shifted around constantly when they cough and when they move. OK, so they can look rubbish one minute, better the next after a coughing fit. They can sound terrible one minute and they're not so bad when your consultant comes to listen. Your consultant goes, oh, they sound fine. And that leads me back to my point about we don't diagnose or treat bronchiolitis based on listening with a stethoscope. We do it by looking from the end of bed, making that assessment of how bad is the respiratory function, how hard are they working, and are they dropping those oxygen saturations? Are they lethargic? Are they not feeding? Okay, because it all comes back to what's the actual effect on the child, not what's the sound when you put the stethoscope on. Hopefully that clears a bit things up. Uh, I'm not going to run out too much because you'll only, only get more confused. So. Uh, this is a look at the calendar for your next talks. Uh, I think I'm going to pass you back uh, to Tampere who will take you through. Uh, I, yeah, thank you so much for that. It was really useful. And I think a lot of the confusing topics at the end, I'm really glad that you stayed to go through them because I know I messed them up a lot. Um, yeah, so these are the talks that are coming up. Uh, we're finishing off March as Peds Month, where we have Dr. 
Dr. Rahim talking about social pediatrics, and then we're kicking off with women's and sexual health into April. Um, and that is what, if we could just go to the next slide, please. Yeah. And then this is just the QR code for the feedback form, and I'm going to put it in the chat again. If everybody could fill it out, it's really useful to, for all of us. Yeah, I'd really appreciate it, guys. Very helpful. Yeah. And I think we, if you don't mind staying for an extra five minutes, just in case anybody yeah, has any other questions. It's all good. Um, yep, I've just got one question. Mm -hmm. What, I'm trying to rephrase it. What do you recommend for a final year student to do if they want to go into pediatrics in terms of trying to make sure they get experience if they haven't got an F1 rotation in PE? Uh, so I wouldn't worry too much about not having F1 rotation because F1 rotations are increasingly rare. So they just don't, you don't get them very much at all. So don't worry too much is my first, first message. I, I did get lucky and have one, but they're not common. And you certainly don't need one to get into pediatrics. You don't actually need to have done any pediatrics to apply to pediatrics or to get in. They're not worried about it. It's postgraduate specialty um, that frankly, we will teach you when you start. Um, so don't worry too much from that point of view. If you want experience from yourself, then as a final year, I'd recommend approaching pediatricians. We're generally a very friendly bunch and asking if you can spend even a day, a week or some elective time with them, if that's something you can fold into your university. Um, especially if, you, if you're really keen, you can sometimes use the summer when we tend to have less uh, students from UK universities around. Um, because it tends to be away, uh, but elective times, if that's built into your programme, it's also a good opportunity. Uh, so I generally... I just literally, for my elective example, gosh, uh, it seemed like a very intimidating, competitive place to get in. And if I'd known that before I applied, I wouldn't have done it. But I actually just messaged a couple of gosh consultants and said, I'm keen, I'm interested. Can, and they were like, yeah, absolutely fine. I have to sponsor you, just put your name down, just email this person, there'll be no problem. So generally don't be afraid to approach us, but also don't worry. If you're too busy, you don't have time, or you're just not sure. If you don't get that job if you're in F1, or even in F2, I wouldn't worry about it. There are lots of clinical fellowships available in the UK um, for what's now called like F3, when people take time out. I did one of those in pediatrics. So I worked in pediatric surgery and HDU uh, for six months in my F3 year. Had a great time, uh, made some money, and then spent the other six months traveling which uh, and doing some uh, expedition medicine, which I'd highly recommend. Um, so think about that if you're really quite not, if it's more, but that should be more if you're not sure. If you're not sure whether you want to do pediatrics, then think about getting using those extra that extra time or those extra jobs to get the experience to make you decide. When you are looking at pediatrics or any specialty, it's really important. I hope you've heard this before, not to look at what the SHOs are doing. Okay. And the junior doctors, what the junior doctors, even the registrars are doing, because that's not really what you're going to do for the rest of your career. The majority of what you'll do for the most of your career is what the consultants are doing. So look at them when you're thinking about specialty, any specialty. Look at the consultants. What do they do? Do they do the stuff that you actually enjoy about the specialty? Do they, if it's surgery, do they spend that time in theatre? If it's paediatrics, do they spend time with children? Uh, which I can confirm they do. They do get to do a paediatric very hands-on, especially for consultants, which is, I think, one of the things that draws people in. Um, so that's hands-on element is still there, if you stay in paediatrics. Um, and just, but, but always be looking at that kind of element because it is a big factor. And it's things sometimes I think people get tempted in by, um, what junior docs are doing, which isn't all pushed off by what junior docs are doing, which I would say is a very small element of what you'll do in your career. I hope, is that helpful? Is that kind of what we look, I'm not sure. I think that's very helpful. And I think um, making sure you look at what the consultants are doing is really good advice because I know it's something I forget. You get so caught up in with, oh, it's going to take me however many years to get there. There's no point thinking about it. Hmm. But you want, but, when, you, when you are there, you'll be a consultant for sort of 30, 35 years. So it's important to think about that's going to be the majority of your life is, as, a, as a consultant. So whatever specialty you're looking at, I would, which obviously should be pediatrics because it's by far the best specialty. Um, but whatever specialty you're looking at, think about what your senior's doing, not what the junior doctor's doing. Obviously, if the junior doctor is doing some work that you hate, don't do that specialty. But um, that's one of the reasons I say don't worry too much about getting that experience before you start um, in terms of doing the job because it, it doesn't matter too much you'll get trained on how to do it and you won't be a pediatric junior doctor for very long, comparatively. Um, so it won't matter that much. We'll train you anyway. No, we don't expect anyone to know any pediatrics, despite this kind of talk. Um, it's, it's, we expect it to be postgraduate. 
I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to ask you something uh, because like I'm not very familiar with the UK system of like uh, internships and everything. I know that uh, if you go to America, you have to have the USMLE step one then uh, to have a practice do because like right now you said that like we can actually go and do some practice in the UK and it doesn't, I don't understand how like without any exams or do we have to take some exams? So those are two sort of two different ways of doing it. Um, you can either think about when you graduated and then going to work in the UK. Um, that is doable. You would have to probably look at how that is done. Because as I say, especially with the EU Brexit situation, I don't know whether how much of that's changing now. Uh, but typically, if you, it depends on whether your medical school is, as it always has been in the past for you, you, European universities, you know, accepted, that medical qualification is accepted. If it is, that makes things much quicker. I think I'm quite confident saying that from the Czech Republic that they are. Um, or always have been. I think that's intended that it will stay the same. Um, you may have to look at uh, doing the PLAB 